You want to go to hell? Fine. Fine. I love you. I love the thoughts of you going to hell. I got some Bible here. I'll be paying close attention to you, brother, sister, in hell. As the eternal ages roll by, I'll be watching you suffer and all the nuances of your exquisite torment and pain and how you do. Eternity, you know, is a long time. I'll be watching you. I'll be watching you. Paying close attention. Hello, YouTube. How's it going? You know, the antics of Mr. Phelps makes it easy to defame Christians as haters. But absolute statements regarding the totality of a group is mere sweeping generalization and falsehoods. So instead of labeling, is it better to make them shut up and keep their beliefs to themselves? I know. We should show them that we're not going to tolerate public displays of their mental illness any longer. Just shut them up. Let's pronounce them verbal rapists. Follow up by verbally castrating them and subjecting each simpleton into sexual storage tanks for state incarcerated populations. Surely this will eliminate this type of verbal rape altogether. Is there such a thing as psychological terrorism? If so, should families legally be shielded from people like Fred Phelps, even if it means trashing our First Amendment? When it comes to public discourse or protest, the threat of criminal prosecution due to the savage attack on the apparitional skeleton referred to as freedom of speech is a chilling reality. Frederick Nietzsche once said, All things are subject to interpretation. Whichever interpretation prevails at a given time is a function of power and not truth. So, how should the First Amendment be interpreted? It is said that the free speech clause of the First Amendment is far from absolute. Hence, this is how, in my opinion, Politically incorrect speech and hate speech were allowed to sneak into existence. Obviously, defamation of character can be challenged, but this legal challenge should not prevent a person from stating what they desire. The ability to challenge reinforces the need for responsible interactions and painfully maintains consequences for what is deemed improper behavior. The law is supposed to find methods to protect the rights of all citizens. And for the sake of clarity, let it be known for the record, I understand there has to be certain types of speech not protected. But this must be a short list in order to maintain the spirit and function of the First Amendment. I do concede that the speech of treason, sedition, perjury, and to a certain degree, speech containing copyright infringements should be upheld. I must admit, sedition is questionable depending on if an authentic lawful authority exists and if governing bodies are completely honorable in action. Speech that shows resistance to unlawful authority is valid. If a government is operating from a position of tyranny or if said government fabricates a reality contrary to verifiable facts, then disruption via freedom of expression is mandatory. State and federal governments may place reasonable restrictions on place, time, and manner of individual expression. These restrictions are meant to, in short, protect the administration of justice. So. Why is not more attention given to this aspect of the issue instead of concern about trashing our First Amendment? Now, 
I would be the first to admit intentional infliction of emotional distress is an unwelcome action. But it is only a fancy and doctored way of issuing a tort which orbits around making speech or action illegal because one is offended. You do not have the right not to be offended. No objectivity can be used in such a quagmire arena of subjectivity if we are concerned about rights. There are three possible approaches to analytic thinking of free speech. The balancing approach, the categorical approach, and the absolutist approach. I favor the absolutist approach because it acknowledges the First Amendment exactly as it states that Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. When we use this avenue, we have one question. The question is whether the action in conduct is really speech and therefore protected, or conduct and therefore subject to reasonable governmental regulation. And I do put emphasis on reasonable. So now, let's contemplate the intellectual musings of the Phelps group. God is punishing the military for the nation's tolerance of homosexuality. Yeah, a fundamentalist church known as the Westboro Baptist Church declares this and much more. Now, Justice Samuel Alito, and I do hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly, stated, our profound national commitment to free and open debate is not a license for the vicious verbal assault that occurred in this case. And I do hope I quoted him correctly. However, I disagree. A verbal attack at worst causes humiliation, offense, generation of deflammatory rhetoric, or attempt to verbally forge abasement. This we can attend to without diminishing what remains of our freedoms. Freedom of expression is not limited to open debate. It is to protect that which is unpopular. America supposedly projects the perfunctory politeness and legal sophistication of dealing with opposition in speech by principal means that dwell in a civil court. You know, a place where governing bodies do not function as the prosecutor. More often than not, this does not appear to be the case. However, the Supreme Court actually protected the inherent rights of the individuals in this particular case. And I am one delighted, though I continue to ask, what is the catch? Now, according to the Washington Post article I have here, entitled, Supreme Court Rules First Amendment, authored by Robert Barnes. Chief Justice John G. Roberts Jr. wrote, As a nation, we have chosen a different course. To protect even hurtful speech on public issues, to ensure that we do not stifle public debate. Now, according to Webster's New World Law Dictionary, just one second, Hate speech is speech not protected by the First Amendment because it is intended to foster hatred against individuals or groups based on race, religion, gender, sexual preference, place of national origin, or other improper classification. Yet, this Chief Justice selected a word that diminish the action from hate to a state of injurious function. It was intriguing that the Chief Justice carefully selected the word hurtful. Many have claimed that Phelps and his cronies should be convicted of hate speech. And though, in my opinion, many of his pronouncements meets the definition of hate speech, Possible punishment was abandoned and the hypocrisy of former judicial actions worked in the favor of the people this time. My, my, the things that make you go, hmm. But the question that remains, would we rather throw critics under the slammer if their methods are distastefully executed? 
do you acknowledge that disagreement with government policy or majority opinion can get you in trouble with the law or is it that just liberal manure without the hobble of subjective faculties is there a point of no return is it ever okay to suppress dissenting voices how important is it to insulate ourselves from criticism and opposition after 9-11 many were willing to give up personal freedoms so the sword of terrorism would not claim them. Remember the Patriot Act? The more unpopular the protest, the more our commitment to the First Amendment is tested. Do we pass the test if we repeat the mistakes made after 